Good afternoon. Maybe I will just wait one more minute and then we will start. Some people are still coming in. Ah, that's also our last speaker. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, Mr. Sieben Thomas. Okay, um, maybe we can start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, nice to, to see uh, so many of you um, in these difficult times and also <laughs> the weather being very nice. Uh, I would like to welcome you to our um, webinar today, which is called uh, Rethinking Work Within the European Deal. Uh, my name is Kati Wiese, and uh, I'm working as Policy Officer for Economic Transition and Gender Equality for the European and Environmental Bureau. Uh, and this workshop is also organized by the EB um, as part of the Horizon 2020 project called Locomotion, which aims to uh, model different pathways for low carbon um, society, including also social, environmental and uh, economic uh, aspects. Um, maybe I could start with some uh, technical information. Uh, so it would be very nice if you could mute yourself during the presentations and interventions, but we really encourage you to use the, the chat um, for questions um, that you might have, and also feel free to already post them during the different in interventions. Um, during the Q&A, you also have the chance to use um, the, haze, the raise your hand function, so if you want to post a question live. And we would also like to inform you that the webinar is um, recorded today. To get a little bit into uh, the topic uh, and the discussion today, so around uh, one and a half years ago, um, the EB, together with the European U Forum, uh, we published a report uh, called Escaping the Jobs and Growth Treadmill. Um, and this report basically out outlines the structural problems of work today, um, such as the structural dependence of um, growth and GDP growth and jobs. And it also provides a bit of a um, policy blueprint, um, how we can create employment in a post-pandemic uh, Europe and also a, a vision um, for the future of work, including four specific uh, recommendations, that being uh, university basic income, um, short uh, working weeks and job sharing, um, job guarantee schemes, and also how we can enhance uh, democracy at work. And now, uh, one and a half years later, um, I think the, pop the topic is um, more relevant than ever. We have also the increasing implementation of the European Green Deal, um, which is uh, this framework uh, meant to transform Europe um, to become fairer and more sustainable and more resilient um, by focusing uh, or targeting on climate and environment objectives. Um, and we believe that such a transformation, of course, must also include um, work, employment and meaningful activities and also the, the reform of those. Um, because otherwise we, we risk to remain in this dependencies on economic growth and, and also um, the, the impacts or the harmful impacts this, this has on, on social and environmental aspects. So how is the transition in the um, domain of work being reflected and taken up in the European Green Deal? Um, so this is something that we would like to discuss during uh, this webinar. Um, the, the background is also the re uh, recent publication of the book uh, called Post Growth Work, Employment and Meaningful Activities Within Plant Planetary Boundaries uh, by Yemi Zaide and Angelika Sand. Uh, in terms of agenda, we first hear from Yemi Zaidel, uh, who will give a brief summary of the book that I just mentioned. Then we have one of our locomotion researchers, um, Tiziano De Stefano here, who will provide us with a short presentation of the science behind working time reductions. Uh, and then we will hear from um, the MEP Pierre Laroutourou, or his assistant, <laughs> 
um, about the experience uh, with working re time reductions uh, within the French context. Uh, and this would then be followed by a discussion with our panelists that we have here today uh, in a, in a Q&A. So uh, without further ado, I would then like to invite our first speaker, who is Amy Seidel. Uh, she is um, the head of research of the economics and um, social science um, unit uh, of the Swiss Federal Research Institute. Amy. Okay. So hello, everybody. Um, do you see uh, do you see the slides or the presentation mode? Yes, uh, presentation mode. <laughs> okay, so I just switched. Now it's yes. fine? Yes, perfect. Okay, <laughs> okay. hello um, everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce um, our main ideas, which we established and uh, other also we and other authors established in this book, um, Kati just mentioned. Um, uh, the presentation was prepared by Angelica and myself, and I'm going to... Uh, to, to give it. So first, I would uh, uh, I want to define the the terms we used. We used the work post growth work and say and um, argue that this is a ver this is the kind of work which we need in a post growth society. And a post growth society is a society that is independent on its economic growth and which has passed the era of permanent economic growth. So why, first I want to give two arguments why we consider post-growth society. One is that the economic growth causes increasing resource use and em environmental harm. And we have recent literature now which shows that uh, absolute decoupling is quite unprobably and uh, will hardly take place. So if there is no absolute decoupling, we definitely have to tackle and to question how we can we can reduce and this permanent economic growth. Uh, a second argument is that uh, because of economic growth, environmental policies are being withheld. So one, one example is environmental taxes. We have had four decades of discussion on environmental taxes, but again and again, when it's in the political era uh, arena, it's argued that it would harm the, the growth, it would harm our economy, and that that's why it is postponed or kind of even um, um, abolished and neglect, neglected. So um, policy and politics plays an important role in um, not, not for, uh, bringing forward environmental policy, and, but also in uh, uh, to push environment, uh, economic growth. So what drives um, politicians and politics to have growth? And we see that the major driver for, for growth policies is the goal of full or high unemployment rates. However, this is not so easy to realize that, and I will argue we are in a, in a trap because there is saturation, demographic change, technical progress, and less uh, growth potentials. And mainly there is this kind of productivity trap which we can observe. What is the uh, productivity trap? If we have economic growth, this econ economic, uh, economic growth also includes a, and leads to an increase of work productivity, which is even for strengthened by external technical progress and by taxation. I will uh, explain that uh, just a minute later. This increase in work product productivity leads to fewer jobs, and this would lead to unemployment or overproduction. And then the political reaction is growth policies or refraining from environmental policies, which lead to economic growth. However, this again increases the productivity and so on. So we are kind of um, in, a, in a trap from which is quite difficult to, um, to, to, uh, to stop. So the questions are which measure would help us um, to 
um, ex, uh, to, 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 to leave this trap and to stop it. One would be to have environmental friendly tax system, because now the tax system ident intensifies this productivity trap. And I will show you a few numbers which will give you an, an idea of that. So in Europe 28, in 2006 and 18, you see the, uh, the rate of different taxes as of the total taxation. So, and you see that the labor tax, taxes are the major part of the total taxation and the labor taxes have even increased a little bit. Whereas the capital taxes have have decreased the environmental taxes even also and the other taxations are quite low so this labor taxes give a push and increased uh, productivity increases another um, another approach to come out of this productivity trap is working time reductions which should reflect the productivity gains and also to foster meaningful activities. And I will explain that. I will remind of Keynes who 100 years ago said that in 100 years we would only work 15 hours, but we, we haven't reached that. So we still work quite a lot. But just to, to tell you that the um, working time reduction is not a, a new argument. So what is meaningful activities? It's the diversity of different kinds of works carried out sequentially or in parallel, it are meaningful uh, for persons and for society. And this can be activities that are paid or unpaid, the vital or inessential, immaterial or material self-determined, and it can be care or community work and activities. So why, why do we argue they should be fostered? It's because meaningful activities can provide and provide um, well-being and cohesion for the society. They fulfill other human aspirations than employment. We know, for example, that uh, such activities uh, strengthen the meaningfulness or the, the idea of autonomy. They allow humans to de develop different capacities compared to employment and they compl complement human subsistence. For example, activities like gardening, do it yourself, repairing, volunteering for the communities. So we have quite a lot of um, benefits such meaningful activities can provide. And now is the question, how could we foster such meaningful activities? It can be through, or it should be, no, it can be, and the precondition is the re reduction of working time, which would pro provide temporal scope for such activities. We also need agency, which coordinates such work and provides structures for such activities. And we would need uh, also um, a change in the education and in, in the training so that people are able and kind of um, a little bit qualified to do such activities. But also we would need or we need um, uh, the fa uh, we need endorsement of such meaningful activities by pensions, by pension and other security claims which would uh, kind of provide a few uh, benefits and also allowances could strengthen meaningful activities and provide incentives. So I want to uh, repeat in a nutshell our arguments. It's that economic growth uh, is uh, harm harmful for environment and it cannot be sustained. However, employment is a major driver. And it's a major driver because of um, productivity gains. To reduce this effect of product productivity gains as a growth driver, we need to change the tax system and we need to reduce working time and to, inc to increase meaningful activities. So if you want to have a further reading, there is the, the cover of the book. And there is also in German a, a, bl a blog where such topics are again and again discussed, it's the blog postwachstum.de. So thank you very much for your attention.
Yumi, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, maybe it would also help if you can uh, post the link to your book again in the chat so people can have a look. Um, and also, um, yeah, great that you could give this. I mean, it's it's quite a, a book with a few pages uh, that you managed to, to put this in a bit, uh, your main arguments into um, 10 minutes. Uh, also, I think a good uh, start for discussion later. Uh, I would like then to invite uh, Tiziano De Stefano, who's um, yeah one of our uh, locomotion researchers, um, and he works for the University of Pisa, um, yeah, to give some <laughs> some academic insights into working time reduction. Uh, Tiziano, we can already see your slides. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, very okay. well. Uh, yeah, good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to share with you some uh, ideas and uh, some. Uh, uh, regarding the working time reduction uh, and how we are dealing with uh, in uh, the locomotion project. So uh, first of all, just to frame the, the issue, we can start asking what's work uh, because uh, for us is, uh, um, I mean, our idea is to that work is linked to uh, a paid work. So we get the salary in, in, uh, uh, by, uh, supplying our time and our skills but the yeah sorry that's the first one but actually the labor market uh, it works in uh, 1845 according to polony the polony studies show through the introduction of poor law reform and it is related to the born also of the of our economic system the capitalistic system that also explains why uh, an increase in labor productivity so labor productivity is the increase in the amount of production uh, for uh, any hour uh, of additional um, uh, work. Is it, it is translated into an increase in total production. That is also, as uh, it was explained before, uh, one of the main drivers of economic growth. Now the, um, the fact that increase of productivity is used to produce more instead of to work less. So when we get an increase in productivity, we can decide either to produce more or to work less. And our system uh, forces us to produce more and more. However, one of the effects, if, if one wants to introduce the working time reduction, we might have two, kind, two different kind of effects. The, uh, first of all, the composition effect that relates to the household consumption bundle. So how, uh, uh, how we can change our consumption bundle, so our uh, consumption consumption habits, uh, given that we have more time. So, for instance, if we have less few time, we are um, induced to uh, consume very uh, highly energy intensive products because they allow us to uh, save time. Uh, while if we are able to have more time, we can. Uh, dedicate to other activities that are more eco-friendly, for instance, uh, like prepare homemade food for, or like traveling with, uh, with the bike by walking instead of uh, take the car. And also the scale effect, because of course, if, we, if the productivity gains are translated into less work, uh, then also the scale of the economic activity could reduce. And so also the impact on um, uh, and the pressure on the environment could be uh, lower. Uh, However, as, ex, as, a, as it was uh, said before, uh, it is not a new idea and uh, it is not new at all. Because if we look at the historical data, we see that uh, in Europe, actually, the weekly working hours have been reduced. So we, we pass from uh, a range between 60, 75 hours in the uh, second half of the 19th century to uh, convergence of, of, of about 40 hours. So uh, uh, working time reduction is possible in, in a sense, and also the system already uh, did so in, uh, in the past. However, we have also to recognize that uh, uh, there are uh, huge differences across countries. So even the European countries are more clo uh, much closer uh, one to each other. If we look at, of course, to other, for instance, poorer countries, the situation is very different. But also, if you look at this, uh, we see that uh, even the composition of uh, working time within a country can differ a lot. So, for instance, in Italy, uh, there is uh, almost 40% 40, 40 of uh, uh, precarious and part time work, and uh, another 20% of people that work uh, more than 41 hours. So, 
even by looking only at the average is not, uh, is not enough. And another issue why it's important to understand what, uh, what is work is, uh, is uh, related to, for instance, to care activity, because also care activities is work, but it's not paid work. So also the, a better distribution of uh, paid work could help also to, uh, uh, to, uh, to fill the gender gap, because as we can see, the care activities as, are uh, mostly um, served by uh, women. And so also th there a better distribution of, of, paid, of paid working time could benefit also the, um, the, the care activities within the house. And uh, so uh, an idea also how to relate all these issues in, uh, in locomotion, I just will be brief, but the idea is that uh, since the social and environmental and economic spheres are, uh, are related, we have to take into account all the direct and indirect effects and so also the side effects of any policy. So for instance, if we want to introduce the working time reduction, we have to recognize that it directly affects, of course, working time and hourly wages, and it then affects the, the total demand, but it also, it also have a direct effect on labor productivity and so on the labor market, so labor demand and supply. And uh, uh, depending on how it varies, how the unemployment varies, it can affect the, the labor force, so the amount of people that want to, want to work, and also the distribution, as we said at the beginning, of the, of the consumption might have uh, an indirect effect on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So it is, it is not enough to work less, but we have also to look on how we use our, uh, our time. So if we consume, if we use our time to take a flight and uh, uh, for a vacation, of course, our, uh, our, uh, our emissions will, uh, will be higher. So to conclude, uh, as, we, as we have seen, uh, as for any policy, we have pros and cons because we have uh, many dimensions to take into account. So for instance, from one side, we have that workers can benefit from more free time, from better social relations. They have time for civic engagement. Firms might even benefit from higher productivity and better flexibility. And from an economic system point of view, we might have more equity, more gender balance. But on the other hand, uh, these uh, process could uh, uh, harm uh, some categories in, instead of others. So we might have that workers could have uh, lower wages. So it depends on if they are poor, it could be, uh, it could be bad. Uh, or, and so uh, the environmental pressure is not, uh, uh, is not automatic that the, the environmental pressure will be lower. And moreover, we can have uh, an imbalance across skills and gender. So uh, uh, any, any policy, should be uh, coordinated with other policies that can uh, take into account all these uh, side effects. I don't know if, uh, okay, I think that uh, I finish. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Tiziano. Uh, we also have a question for you in the chat, but we will take this for uh, oh. during the Q&A session, if that's okay for you. And also, I think my colleagues will share some information about the project uh, of locomotion. So you, yeah, if someone is interested also to learn more about this project, um, please feel free um, yeah, to visit the website. Um, before we come to our panel, I would then uh, like to invite um, a member of Parliament, uh, of European Parliament, uh, Pierre Laroutourou. I hope it, I hope I said it correctly. Uh, who has some uh, long, long experience with working time reductions uh, in in the French context, and who uh, was so kind to give us a bit of an insight today. Um, Mr. Laroutourou. Hello. Yeah. Um, hello, I, I'm really sorry, as I, as I told you just before we started, um, Mr. Lalotru has been called uh, for an uh, emergency uh, voting procedure in the plenary of the parliament today related to the situation in Ukraine. So he asked me to deliver um, the, 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 the little speech that he prepared. Uh, I hope that's okay. Um, so um, hello, uh, everyone. And thank you very much for these first uh, presentations that were uh, actually that already covered um, quite uh, a large uh, part of the topic that um, we were thinking of covering today. Can you see my screen? Are you seeing the yes. full screen? Yes, perfect. Right. Excellent. 
So um, I will really not repeat what has already been covered, and I will uh, really focus on the, um, the specific um, French experience. Of course, I have to, um, to uh, thank EB and all the organizers um, who uh, took the initiative for this debate, because it is a crucial debate at a crucial time today more than ever. Um, we do believe that we have a window of opportunity for uh, talking more and more about uh, working time reduction. Um, I will focus on uh, one aspect that has been uh, briefly mentioned uh, that for us is key. Uh, Pierre Laotu has been working on the topic for more than 30 years, uh, and I've been working with him on the topic for a little less than, than 10 years. And um, all the aspects that we mentioned are very important to us. Uh, we tend to focus a little bit more on the um, impact on unemployment. Um, uh, because, of course, before the COVID crisis, before the current um, uh, economic crisis, uh, mass unemployment has been already uh, ruining millions of lives around Europe. And we have come to get used to uh, mass unemployment being uh, given and something that we can do nothing about. Uh, uh, and we have to remember that it has not al uh, always existed. Uh, and that some uh, some uh, 40 or, or 50 years ago, uh, the situation was not the same and unemployment was, was much uh, lower. Uh, and if we are serious about uh, fighting unemployment, not only uh, for um, our, our uh, brothers and sisters in humanity that are experiencing and suffering from unemployment, but also for uh, all the workers that are uh, also suffering from unemployment because uh, unemployment is um, pressuring down salaries for all of us. Uh, you can see here the share of GDP, um, the share of salaries in GDP for the last 40 years in all OECD countries. We can see that the share in GDP uh, uh, for salaries has been going down. And it's quite simple to understand. In, in, uh, in most companies uh, nowadays, the negotiation on salaries is very fast. Huh? If you are not happy, you can go find another job. Uh, there is no way for, for um, no, no space for negotiation when, when employment is at, at 10% or, or higher. Uh, and so this, this fear of mass unemployment has transferred 10% of GDP from the pockets of workers to the, the pocket of shareholders. Um, I will not come back on, on the situation on, on, on growth. It's been already covered quite extensively, productivity as well. I will go straight to the French um, case. Um, um there we go uh what is in interesting i think in the in the case of what has been experienced in france is um pierre laudio has been working um in the, the early 90s with former prime minister michel rocard on uh, a solution to implement in real life the four, the four day uh, work week um with two goals no decrease in salaries of course uh, millions of people are, of course, uh, not in a position to 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 experience any um, loss in terms of uh, of uh, of uh, purchasing power or or uh, or quality of life. No decrease of salary and no increase uh, of the cost for the employer and for the customers, just so that it's actually workable in the current um, economic system that we that we know. Uh, and the proposal that was developed uh, together with the trade union CFDT in France was based on a simple fact. In most of our countries, in Europe at least, uh, luckily we have uh, unemployment uh, allowance and, and schemes that are um, contribute, contributing by billions of euros to face uh, the consequences of, of unemployment. And uh, thinking uh, behind this proposal was to activate those spendings. So to put this money uh, that we today uh, put in uh, in an employment allowance uh, on the negotiation table and to say that if and only if the company creates good paying, decent, stable jobs uh, and reduces working time, then uh, those spendings can be uh, activated. Concretely, how does it work? Um, and it's not just a theory or a utopia. It has been implemented by 400 companies in France, and it has benefited 17,000 workers. Um, if and only if the company 
um, in, implements the four day work week, uh, 32 hours per week, per, per week uh, and hires 10%, uh, creates 10% extra jobs, uh, real jobs, good quality jobs, permanent contracts, then the social contributions can go down 8%. Uh, so that's the cost uh, for the company is uh, zero and uh, the total payroll, payroll is balanced. And the good news is uh, because, of course, many of us, when we hear that, will we'll think that it's very bad, of course, for unemployment uh, public um, uh, schemes. Uh, but you have to think that jobs are being created, so you have less unemployed people um, to, uh, to pay for, and you have more people who are working and contributing. To, um, so it's a win for the, the, the public um, and employment and social security system. It's a win for workers. Uh, and it's actually a win for companies because workers, and it has been shown, are uh, more uh, productive and uh, more uh, creative and are just uh, uh, have a better life. So they, they, they also actually work better. I will not go into the de details of these tables just to show you an actual example on of one of these companies that is producing producing yogurt and cheese in france uh, they have 800 workers and they have created 120 uh, additional jobs um, in implementing uh, the four-day work week um, of course the four-day week is not the only model that will fit all uh, sectors of the economy and all kind of companies uh, it, it can be mod modulated like one month uh, out of, of four or one week out of four, depending on the sector. Uh, so timetable can be mo mo modulated. We, we call it the four day work week a la carte. Um, based on those 400 pioneer companies, we can uh, assess that 1.6 million jobs could be created in France. Uh, you can do the math for the rest of, rest of Europe. That, that, that's, uh, that's millions of jobs that can be created. And that is also in France, that would be 1.6 million people that would contribute to public pension funds as well. Uh, so that is also uh, the best way to uh, save our public pension system um, without having to uh, change the age of, of, uh, of pension. Uh, I'm already, um, I think, up with uh, my time. So I will just conclude uh, this has, uh, Today, it seems that, and we were discussing it with, with uh, Trade Union and his friends, uh, it has been the great struggle of pro progressive um, uh, and, and trade unionists for, for a century. But for 20 years, it seems that it has become the great taboo. So we need to launch this debate again. And it's starting again in many, in many countries. Um, and uh, we, we have to, to increase this um, struggle. It is, of course, a history struggle. I will not come back on that. Um, and today, more than ever, uh, since we have been experiencing in the COVID crisis, uh, in most European countries, there have been schemes because there is less work. Uh, you have to find ways uh, to not lay off all the workers and to not completely break down the economy and the companies. So we found ways and workers have been experiences, experiencing that you can be working less uh, to lay off less workers. Uh, so maybe now we can start again talking about working less to achieve work for all and, and a better life. Um, the, there is broad public support for the idea broader than ever. Here, for instance, in Belgium, we have 72% support for, for the week, 62% in France, etc. And to conclude, if we remember that mass unemployment is a key factor in salary deflation in the decrease of salaries um, all around uh, Europe and around the world, then we can think that with the four-day work week, the balance of power will change. And this is actually the most powerful solution we have to also see an increase in salaries, uh, especially for the most uh, vulnerable and uh, uh, poor uh, workers. Uh, so of course, we uh, in the team of Pierre Lauti at the parliament are uh, more than happy to have this discussion uh, further with any of you. Uh, if you're interested, you can contact us. Thank you. Uh, Michel, thanks a lot. Uh, also, thanks a lot for stepping in for Monsieur Laboutourou and thanks a lot for yeah, giving a bit of a concrete example also uh, what it could look like in France. Um, I mean, as you said, maybe that can also be um, inspiration for, for other member states. Um, so thanks a lot for this. 
Um, I would then like to move to our um, panel today and welcome our panelists uh, for today's session. Unfortunately, um, Ms. Langen-Siepen uh, also had to cancel last minute uh, due to, um, I think, a meeting related to Ukraine as well. Um, but yeah, we have uh, still three uh, very excellent uh, speakers today. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, Jan Mayofa from the European U Forum, um, who is a, a senior policy officer and also one of the uh, lead uh, authors of the report that I mentioned in the beginning. And then we also have um, Ludovic Wirt from, uh, from the unions. He's the confederal uh, Secretary of the European Trade and Union Confederation, uh, ITUC. They have also been a bit involved in the report I mentioned earlier. Um, and then I would also um, very welcome um, Mr. Frank Sivan Thomas, who is the head of the unit uh, in DG Employ in the section for Fair Green and Digital Transition. And he has uh, coordinated research on the work on the recent uh, recommendations on ensuring a fair transition. So we have um, prepared a specific question for each of you, uh, and you have around five minutes to, to answer this, and then um, yeah, we can see if there are any other questions, or if you want to react to each other, and then also open uh, the Q&A for our participants. And I would like to start with Jan. And uh, we were wondering, um, presenting the European um, Youth or presenting European youth organizations, what are your um, or what do you think are the expectations of young people in terms of the future of work uh, in a post growth area? Thanks, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, so, yeah, as Kathy said, my name is Jan Mayofer. I'm working with the European Youth Forum, which is the umbrella of youth organizations in Europe. So we have uh, 107 members uh, across uh, all European countries and uh, seek to represent their interests towards the EU institutions mainly. Um, talking about work and employment, it's obviously a huge uh, topic for young people, mainly because there's a lack of it. Uh, we've seen the graphic before. Uh, the uh, youth unemployment rate uh, has always been and still is much higher than uh, the unemployment rate in the general population. So necessarily that's a big topic um, for us as well. And how most uh, would respond to that is, well, you know, we just need to uh, create jobs for, for young people, right? Um, but I'm working in a, in a small team, uh, working on, on sustainability. And uh, the way we look at things is that we like to, you know, take a systemic view and rather look at the system as a whole and identify the root causes and tackle these. Um, so I'm just going to make uh, three uh, brief points uh, also from the report and then happy also to have a discussion and answer any question. Now, the first point is uh, that the future of work is no foregone conclusion and that we must actively work towards labor market that is uh, sustainable and desirable. Now, why do I say that? Because a lot when we, you know, when we talk to uh, decision makers in the EU, for instance, it often feels like, you know, the prevailing view on the future of work is that it's a force beyond our control, that it's shaped by, you know, certain megatrends like, you know, demographic change, um, automation, the climate crisis, globalization, etc. That's certainly true. Um, and what follows from that is that basically, you know, most of the programs uh, seek to prepare young people for that future. So you have... Uh, green skills, digital skills, to name just a few buzzwords, right? Um, and, you know, that's certainly a good thing, but what we think is, you know, equally important or even more important um, is that young people take an active role in shaping the labor market of the future. So we get a little bit away from that, you know, deterministic view where young people are just, you know, perceived as, as passive agents that somehow have to be prepared for the future of the labor market. Um, so how are we going to do that? That brings me to the, the second point. And uh, well, I'm not going to repeat what's been said before, um, and it's also in our report, but I think the goal of work in a post-growth economy is really to decouple living and well-being from the obligation to work for a wage. So what we did in the report that, that Kathy mentioned that I, I co-authored with her is, well, we basically described how our economic system is dependent on both 
uh, economic growth and employment relation and how that's sort of related to each other. And it's been mentioned before, I'm happy to see that every, uh, every speaker before mentioned uh, productivity, labor productivity as the key thing, because it is really the key thing. And I'm not gonna repeat that, but um, just to quickly, quickly say that I think the key thing here is the productivity dividend. So what do you do with the, you know, the, the, the labor you essentially save from the technological changes we had, you know, from computers, et cetera, from just being able to produce much more efficiently? Well, I'm trying to explain it very simple, and we did that in the report, but basically you have two options, right? If labor productivity doubles, then the first option is, you know, you can keep the output uh, constant. You have the same amounts of goods and services, and you can uh, reduce the working time by 50%. The other option is uh, you have uh, the working time on average being the same, and then, you know, you double the number of goods and services you produce. Um, so it's really simple. It's like a basic formula. Uh, and what we've seen in the graph on working time reduction is that basically after the Second World War, it really stayed the same. So we've always chosen the latter. And in the report, we essentially explain that in our economic system, we didn't have a choice, but to always uh, produce more because what happens if we, if we don't chase economic growth? Well, we have an economic crisis. So most recently, I think we've seen that with the COVID pandemic, right? So that even if you put the brakes on our economy just for a few weeks or a month, the whole thing basically implodes. And you know you have all an economic crisis. You have all the negative effects like poverty, mass uh, unemployment, and so on and so forth. So the only way to get out of that is more economic growth in our current system, which obviously has very negative effects uh, on the environment and on a number of things. Um, so uh, I think that you know the, what's really important is that we when we talk about post growth and degrowth is an understanding of what it actually means. Because I think a lot of people, when they talk about post-growth, they think, okay, we're just gonna degrow some sectors and you know, grow some other sectors and then somehow it will work. But I think what's really, really important and that was mentioned before as well is that you know, the, the goal of post-growth or whatever you wanna call it or beyond growth must be to decrease the structural and procedural dependency uh, of our economy on growth. I think a helpful metaphor is sort of a bicycle that we always use. So in our current economic system, you know, a bicycle always has to go forward because what happens if you, if you stand, the bicycle falls, right? So we'd like an economy that has sort of, you know, little support wheels that doesn't, you know, crash immediately when you just hit the brakes on it um, for a little bit. So I think that's, uh, work is really key for that. And if you free essentially people, um, from the obligation to work for a wage, often under very bad conditions, uh, through a policy such as a universal basic income, um, you know that would really, really help to uh, create a better and more sustainable economic system. Uh, last point quickly, and that's sort of going a bit beyond what's been said before. Um, I think to create the space for these uh, post-growth uh, work policies, such as you know the one that you know been mentioned before, like working time reduction, or universal basic income, or uh, some of the others that we mentioned in the report, um, I think what we have to do is to emancipate ourselves in a way from the work ethic or the productivity craze or whatever you want to call it that we currently have. Uh, it was actually really, really interesting. So we talked to our members and we were sort of floating the idea of a UBI and there were actually, you know, uh, surprisingly a lot of, uh, you know, member organizations of us not in favor of the idea. We also had the example in, in Switzerland, I think, where they had a referendum on a, on a UBI and the majority actually, you know, uh, wasn't in favor of it, which is, you know, quite surprising because, you know, it's basically money for, for everyone. Um, and why is this the case? Well, I think the main reason for that is that, you know, this work ethic, the productivity craze or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, it permeates our culture uh, so deeply that in some ways we're just not ready for some of these, these policies. I mean, just to give you one example, uh, we work a lot with volunteering organizations, right? That's a big part of, of, of youth work. And there is definitely a trend in volunteering where, 
you know, everything that you do as volunteering some has to look good on your CV and has to increase your employability and these kind of things. So you basically, you know, it switches the whole logic around where you don't volunteer because you think it's a good thing, it's fun, you do it for other people, etc. But you do it for yourself, you do it because you become more employable. And you see, I think you see that logic, logic really everywhere. You know, if you're anything like me, you know, it's really, really, really hard to get that productivity kind of thinking um, out of your head, even if you're not working in your leisure time. So what do you do after work? You're doing a, a workout or you go for networking. Uh, it's so deeply ingrained in our culture. And I think ultimately it makes us really, you know, unhappy. It increases the burnout rates um, uh, in our society if we have this utilitarian view on everything that basically everything we do has to have a productive purpose. So I think it really starts also with a cultural shift, not only a policy shift. And I think that if we design these policies, we also need to think about how do we shift the general discourse uh, towards a, a, a discussion where we say, okay, maybe it's more okay to be, you know, quote unquote, lazy or do nothing or do activities that don't have a, a productive purpose. So I think the opposite of work is essentially play, right? So, you know, playing music and all these kind of things and just making that a little bit more acceptable in our society. And I think it would really help uh, us to also progress on some of these, these policies that were mentioned before. Um, sorry if I went a little bit over time, um, but these are my, my three points. I'm gonna post them in the chat and also post the reports uh, that we did with the EB if you wanna read it, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jan. Uh, thanks a lot for the summary of your three points and also to um, bring in a bit of a philosophical discussion about uh, yeah, our cultural attitudes towards work. And maybe this also links actually a bit to meaningful activities, what Yemi mentioned in the beginning and how we can how we can foster this. Um, I would then like to invite uh, Ludovic. Uh, uh, who is also uh, yeah was also in our previous event actually it's always um, yeah also very uh, interesting to hear the the points of the trade unions of course um, so um, Edric has actually um, repeatedly uh, put an emphasis on working time reduction in the last decades so we were wondering where you stand now um, with the discussion uh, regards to the topic of uh, post growth. Thank you, Katie, and uh, hello, everyone, and happy to continue this discussion uh, in time uh, um, where it's quite needed uh, to discuss this and uh, happy also to come after uh, the, the, the interventions that we had before. Um, as, um, in fact, more or less everything was said, so I had to uh, to rewrite a speech on on basis of uh, the thoughts I have uh, uh, on the basis of what was said. So I will begin by um, yeah saying that um, it's 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 good that it was mentioned also at the beginning this uh, visionary uh, uh, vision of Keynes for um, in uh, in 1930 about uh, was said by Irni I think uh, about 15 uh, hours uh, a week. Um, I think here uh, it was he wrote that in 1930, so it means that uh, 100 years after 2030, it's in eight years. In fact, in eight years we also have to have the minus 55 percent of greenhouse gas emission. Uh, at least. Uh, so there might be a combination of a fight uh, that we have to have together uh, with three dimension, the, maybe the fight for 15 euros a week, uh, an hour um, as wages, the fight for 15 hours a week. Uh, so maybe this is too, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, too uh, uh, utopian to uh, to achieve in eight years, but uh, let's put it like that. And the fight for minus 55% at least of greenhouse gas emission. And I think that in fact, these three qu uh, questions uh, inter uh, interrelated, uh, in fact, interrogates uh, the model of society that we need. And I think that's also what you want to discuss with uh, post-growth. Uh, so um, this makes me say on uh, that on uh, the question of re uh, working time reduction i appreciate also when uh, michel said that uh, yeah for for 
four days a week, it's not only four days a week. It's the question, in fact, of how do we uh, reduce working time uh, in general? So it can be uh, only another option. It can be on a weekly basis. It can be on a monthly basis. It can be on an annual basis, uh, but it can also be uh, on a career basis. So the question of uh, working time, uh, what is the working time that we uh, request people to uh, to have uh, to uh, to access uh, to uh, the different social protection uh, to uh, um, yeah to uh, on a career basis for example in a context where there's a push to increase this working uh, time because even if we have discussion about reduction of working time on a weekly basis if on the career basis, there's an uh, increase of the number of years you have to uh, to work. In fact, there's no uh, reduction of working time. Uh, be, uh, so we we don't uh, uh, we have to think globally on um, what is requested from an individual to get, uh, for example, access uh, to uh, to retirement. Uh, so this is why I say uh, always, um, and it was easier when uh, there was a, a lot of productivity increase uh, in companies when there's a productivity the increase in companies for unions it was quite comfortable because you could bargain uh, what would go in the uh, for the shareholders and you could bargain what would go for the improvement of wages or reduction of working time for workers now we are in a situation where productivity does not increase so much and where shareholders takes all uh, where it's difficult to uh, have margins for improvement uh, in wages so it means that there's also and there uh, it means that in terms of strategy also for unions when uh, you don't have a lot on the table uh, at company level, at sectoral level, uh, you have to choose if you uh, bargain for improvement uh, in wages or uh, improvement uh, uh, investment uh, in uh, creation of jobs in the in the company, uh, or if you go also to fight for the uh, diminishing of uh, working time. So it. At company level, that's something that is quite complicated. This, uh, this is because, and uh, this is why it's really in, in, important to bring it as a, um, a societal uh, uh, discussion. Um, but so there are different options that can be done. Yeah, the diminishing at a, uh, on weekly basis, on monthly basis, but also yeah, in uh, number of if uh, the holidays number of holidays per year are improved, uh, are increased. It's also an improvement. Uh, it's also a reduction of uh, working time. Um, and I would like to say that working time in uh, reduction is in fact a reality, a hard fact. Uh, it is, uh, but it is an individual working time. Uh, if we take the number of hours uh, pr uh, that are uh, done by uh, someone on a uh, on a uh, an average uh, on a daily basis, it is a hard fact that uh, indicates it is uh, declining. The question that we have as a political choice is: Will it be collective working time reduction? Because individual working time reduction uh, is there uh, in average, uh, but with the pressure on uh, a part of the population to work more, which put the competition with those who uh, don't have a job. This this is how yeah, capitalism works, uh, putting competition between uh, workers to lower uh, uh, the, the, the working conditions. And so it means that the policy option that we have is to discuss about collective work uh, working time uh, reduction and this is only possible if we present it also without loss of income and with compulsory uh, compensatory hiring uh, because this is the only way that in a company uh, when you reduce working time people can get the same salary but there is also uh, someone that is hired. So this is a vision uh, of uh, society that, uh, that that we can have. Um, youth unemployment was, uh, when I was talking about competition, I'm also thinking about uh, uh, Jan speaking about youth unemployment. For me, it's also youth unemployment is in fact also a consequence uh, on the pressure on working time on people, that we want people to work more uh, uh, longer uh, in the career. It means that there's less jobs at the beginning uh, because there's less people going to retirement every year when uh, there's a reform uh, of pension systems that make that people can uh, have to go to retirement at 67 instead of 65. This means that there's two generations uh, of people coming in the labor market that will fight for less jobs uh, so this is uh, also uh, consequences uh, of political decisions to, uh, to put more pressure on people working more. Uh, there is also pressure on working more on a daily, uh, on a weekly basis, like 45 hours a week uh, with flexible systems in some uh, countries. And this has been pushed uh, in the last decades 
by the liberalization agenda, um, also by uh, uh, by the different member states and uh, by the Commission. So it's important that this uh, is not uh, the way forward uh, in the situation that we are uh, now. It is important that, um, as it was also said by uh, Michel, the question of uh, short-term schemes, we have shown but with COVID, that short-term schemes, in fact, uh, were also a shock absorber. So it means that it's also uh, uh, possible to reduce working time, protect jobs, uh, and make sure uh, that uh, people uh, keep uh, their uh, secure their em uh, employment. So if it is a response to crisis, uh, it is also a, a, a response uh, for a long-term vision, a long-term vision that integrates also the environmental uh, dimension. Uh, this leads me to the conclusion then on on yeah on post-growth. Um, I think what's important in the discussion in uh, with post-growth it's that. Uh, post-growth can only work if it's uh, a vision of transformation of society, because if it's only um, what would put the what would make that working conditions uh, conditions of living of people would be better with or without growth, without societal transformation of how we uh, how we produce, without putting the burden or uh, more responsibilities on employers, without democratizing also the workplace. This will not change. It will on, only be individual choices of working less or producing less, etc. But if you don't uh, democratize work, uh, uh, it is uh, we can only discuss then about cultural shift, uh, cultural uh, uh, changes. But in the uh, in the sphere of the production, uh, the um, uh, the means of production will still be in the hands of the main political actors, which means the company owners. And if we don't uh, change this if we do not democratize this place so there's democracy in society but there's few democracy at the workplace uh, democracy at the workplace is limited to trade union information and consultation in a lot of uh, spaces uh, and in some cases there's a lot of union busting and uh, really uh, uh, a lot of companies trying to avoid that uh, people can organize together to uh, improve their working condition if we do not democratize this workplace in fact all the discussion we would have about post growth uh, would not lead to uh, to changes. So it's not only a political vision to have; it's also things that we have uh, to concretely change in the uh, in the workplaces. And for that, trade unions are the leaders. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Ludovic, um, for yeah, also highlighting again that there are different forms of working time reductions and 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 also um, yeah, the need to tackle the current power imbalance that are also one of the root causes of our unsustainable system. Um, in a way, or one, one part of it. Um, yeah, with, with that, I would like to then welcome our um, last panelist. Uh, I think it would be also interesting to get some, some perspectives from the, from the Commission and also come, come back a, a bit to what's also the part of the, the theme of this, the webinar today to also see, okay, what role does the European Green Deal play or what role uh, does work within the European Green Deal play in, in, in the just transition? Um, so, Mr. Um, Sieben Thomas, uh, we uh, so your question from from us from our side was, um, what role did yeah, employment and meaningful activities um, play in the formulation of policies within the European Green Deal? Um, yeah, from from your perspective or from your working area. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as was said before, I'm working in a new unit in DG Employment, which deals with the fair, green, and digital transitions, as well as research and the link with the research program. And I say it up front because I will say a word on both. Um, I will focus on Ludovic's third point, third target, the minus 55% for the time being. I have probably to be honest, I think the Commission with the Green Deal um, has published a strategy which it sees as a strategy or the, as a vision, long term vision for, for such a transformation of our economies and societies. Um, but obviously, given the many uh, issues you mentioned, there's scope <laughs> to develop certain areas more, and we do not deny this. Um, I will not go into this in much more detail now, probably just to say that there has been work in the context of the so-called um, Employment Social Development in Europe report in 2020-21, where we have looked at the inclusiveness of growth, um, and where the conclusion was drawn that uh, growth has overall not been inclusive let's say in the decade, decade before the pandemic, after the financial crisis, um, and that this has weakened resilience. So there's an awareness of the need for inclusive growth and a lot of actions focus on this. 
also on working time um there is obviously awareness that a lot is changing now in the new world of work and the pandemic uh, the increased uh, digitalization teleworking and so on this is, uh, partly has probably led to both increased productivity but also increased working time in this new form of work and there's a well awareness we need that um, that policymakers have to shape this so the initiatives on working conditions of platform workers the ongoing debate on the right to disconnect and, and more to, to be discussed. So, uh, and the commission will issue this year an implementation report on the working time directive, which is, a, let's say, has a specific focus, but which probably could also lead to follow up discussion. Uh, and last but not least on the link, I will not say a lot on the link between labor productivity and um, um, and employment, but probably there the views um, are also diverging, but uh, certainly we do promote um, also research and actions which, which make research also under Horizon Europe and other programs on degrowth, on post-growth, uh, on possible policy recommendations, and also on, um, let's say, research projects which ensure that new technologies, be the green, digital, uh, whatever, uh, are complementary, complementary in the sense that they do uh, maintain jobs and create jobs and uh, alleviate probably also certain tasks which, which may be difficult or difficult in the climate change context. These are all debates to be had, but to be fair, um, probably that, that that was not the answer of the Commission in the Green Deal, and that it's not a degrowth strategy. But when the Commission presented it, it was presented as, a, as Europe's new growth strategy or new economic development strategy. I will tr try to make three points as well. The first one on um, um, on this growth strategy and the role of fairness in it. Probably just to say that um, our starting base was to say, and I, I relate to the first speaker, Mr. Seidel in particular, uh, we do not deny that a lot of the production model um, does create problems, does produce significant harm, and that we need to accelerate the transition um, to reach the ambitious climate targets. But there's also the recognition that decoupling is possible. There has been progress in the last 10, 20 years with emission reductions going together with um, uh, economic growth. Um, we do recognize that inaction is not an option. Not doing anything would be worse, would put uh, in particular hit by in particular the most vulnerable and people's livelihoods, health, and the economy overall. Um, and this even more so in the current context we are living after the, uh, the aggression of um, uh, Russia on Ukraine, where the Commission has responded and the leaders in Versailles have uh, agreed that we need to accelerate this transition to roll out clean energy and the renewables much faster and also reduce our energy dependence, uh, dependence from fossil fuels. Um, this to, um, to say that uh, all of this we believe does respond to the needs of people. We published in some of the reports I mentioned, survey results where people across all age groups, across all skill groups, across all countries agree that climate change is the defining task of our times. Uh, that we need to respond and the majority of people also feel the personal responsibility they want to do something though they are open to also change behavior or change consumption patterns and others and uh, one point important or two more important points which we see as main elements of the narrative of the green deal is fairness uh, fairness is one of the objectives it's not just a climate and energy target fairness is one of the objectives of the green deal this obviously includes as a general response to your question, employment, social impacts, focus on, on, on maintaining income, well-being, and people's livelihoods. What differs probably is that um, the Green Deal, and there have been two massive legislative packages, Fit for 55 packages last year, are based on the assumption that a triple dividend, as we call it, is possible, that it's possible to create jobs, to improve well-being of all, uh, leaving no one behind, and to reduce emissions if we have the right accompanying policies in place. And a lot of the difficulty is, and what our unit now is working on and colleagues are working on, is what those accompanying policies, including on the employment and social side, are. So in you, you are well aware of the 55 packages. In some of the initiatives, you have targeted measures. For example, energy taxation. Member states are allowed to exempt certain households from energy taxes, or there's a proposal for a social climate fund. But there's also the recognition that more is needed. And that's why we have presented in December last year a proposal for a council recommendation on ensuring a fair transition, which tries to provide guidance to member states on how to address labor and social impacts and how to ensure, put the right policies in place depending on their national challenges 
um, to, 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 to accompany this and ensure that jobs can be created and that it's not the, the poorest who have to pay the price, particularly difficult in the current context. And I just would like to highlight that in the list of recommendations made, um, there's in particular one to focus also on the support of quality employment, which is probably close to the notion of meaningful employment you're mentioning here, and to facilitate transitions. There are many others which do relate, I think, to issues discussed, also to an, uh, empowering energy consumers, promoting energy communities uh, run by citizens, um, also facilitate access to sustainable consumption and uh, incentivize changes in consumption and production modes. So all of this is in the list of recommendations currently being discussed. Uh, and also the many of the measures uh, addressed by Mrs. Seidel, like uh, for example, the tax shift away from labor to environmental taxation or a holistic education strategy are part of initiatives the commission is taking. Another proposal for recommendation was issued in December which looked at, um, which is a, a recommendation on education for sustainability at large. So with a long-term perspective also. Two more short points, maybe on the employment side. Uh, why do we believe that there's potential to create employment and what are the sectors concerned? And probably you all know the, which sectors are facing job losses or uh, transformation uh, challenges, but I want to mention uh, also sectors which where we expect job creation in renewable energy, construction, waste management, circular economy, local value chains. Many of those can probably relate to the notion of meaningful employment you're mentioning. Uh, and our analyses also show that there is an increased demand in what we call middle income, middle skilled jobs, notably in construction to help isolate, insulate housing, uh, et cetera. Um, and we find that this uh, may run counteract labor market polarization we see from the other mega trends you have mentioned. So here again, we believe that the right policies, reskilling, upskilling on time, et cetera, can help, can help shape a more positive outcome. And here again, I would like, to, like before to say, we believe this responds also to the needs of both people, job seekers and uh, industry. So on the job seeker side or people side in particular, especially Eurobarometer on the future of Europe earlier this year showed that nine out of 10 young Europeans and also almost 90% of Europeans overall um, uh, agree that tackling climate change can help improve their own health and well-being overall. So the notion of uh, well-being and uh, let's say new post-growth strategy. But surveys also show that young people when asked where, where they want to contribute in the economy and the labor market in the future, um, clearly say that they're looking for professional paths that combine flexibility and a deep sense of purpose. Again, meaningful jobs. A recent surveys from Austria, for example, have shown that I think more than 50% of young people say they want to contribute to fighting climate change in their professional uh, work. Um, I think this is important to say, and it also addresses the needs of industry and the economy overall, because we are facing a moment of increasing labor and skill shortages in sectors. So here again, reskilling, upskilling policies are absolutely needed and we need to have jobs which are attractive to job seekers out there, to skilled job seekers, um, so that they can contribute uh, because th this is needed to, to, to reach our climate targets overall. Our main narrative is to say we have to include the employment social dimension from the outset, otherwise we'll not be able to reach uh, our ambitious climate target goals and uh, reskilling, upskilling people and providing attractive jobs for people in those sectors needed um, the circular economy waste management, which today are sectors with the worst records in terms of occupational health and safety risks and standards, or construction, or other sectors which may be less well paid, also in the care economy and others, um, is certainly key for the transition. And my last point, or just to drop a few other initiatives the Commission is um, undertaking to increase employment in meaningful sectors, I will keep it short there. But all of this relates to ongoing work in the, uh, under the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan also. Um, and uh, there are other upcoming initiatives on the right to repair, circular economy and so on, which probably also relate a lot to the discussion we had on a new um, transformative model. Just to say, ongoing initiatives include the Social Economy Action Plan, which tries to boost employment in sectors, um, in sectors contributing to fair and sustainable growth and sectors and companies which put social and environmental purposes first, care services, recycling, and so on, social enterprises at large. We also will issue this year communication on the European care strategy, which will address the issue of uh, working conditions for critical workers, including health workers who have suffered a lot, uh, obviously in the pandemic uh, and who have been uh, showcased clearly, like many others, as, as essential workers for the overall functioning resilience of our models. 
and I also would like to relate to the environmental action program, the eighth environmental action program, which has for only with the had an agreement in council and parliament, um, which does provide a long term vision uh, on well being for all. Um, highlighting job creation potential in the sectors I mentioned, circular economy, nature, conservation, or biodiversity. I'm mentioning this because this comes together with a strong call for indicators in these areas to also measure this and to make it part of our um, maybe economic, social economic modeling context and also our social scoreboard includes such indicators. And my very last point, I would like to also refer to the new ALMA initiative, an initiative which should help support mobility for people without formal uh, diploma recognition. Um, here probably there are also, I'm speaking a bit for myself here, but uh, there are probably ways to, to combine integration of young people, people who have difficulties to enter the labor market with meaningful jobs to contribute to the green transition and other transformations we want to support um, because these are people who may be as ambitious as others and as um, enthusiastic as others as contributing to this transition. I leave it there for the time being. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sivan Thomas. Thanks a lot for um, yeah outlining the initiatives. I mean, even though we, we might not agree on everything, I think it's also interesting to hear from you what's out there. Uh, maybe you can also share some of the research because I'm not sure um, that, for example, that I'm aware of all of those that you just mentioned. And then, of course, it's also interesting for us where we still see like some potential to, um, yeah, where, where might be some improvement for certain, certain things in the European Green Deal or what's already happening. So thanks a lot um, for, for your intervention and for being here today. Uh, so we have uh, 20 minutes left. So I think um, I would like to open the, the floor for everyone. <laughs> so if you have any question, uh, please feel free to raise your hand or put it in a chat box. Um, you can also ask uh, questions to um, Tiziano um, or Iami or also Michelle, he's still here. <laughs> I think he's also still happy to answer some questions. Um, while you are maybe still um, thinking about one, there was one concrete question to, uh, to Tiziano. Um, if uh, in the locomotion working time reduction model, uh, you consider economic outputs as ex exogenous, and if yes, how do you model it? So yeah, it's maybe a bit of a technical question. Uh, yeah, thanks for the, the question. Now, actually, uh, economic growth is not exogenous. Uh, I mean, the model is quite large, and uh, I mean, the main idea is to uh, to build an economic model based on system dynamics and input output. So it is not based on a general model. And uh, through uh, the, the main idea is to recover the structure of uh, intermediate trade across firms and between firms and final consumers in order to get the structure of the economy. And uh, for each sector, we link uh, several type of uh, variables either social, economic, and environmental. So for instance, the number of, of workers, the type of workers, uh, or the amount of resource that is used by each sector, and so on and so forth. And uh, the model is uh, calibrated at the global level. So we have uh, uh, all the European countries with uh, other major countries like China, India, Brazil, and so forth, and other uh, economic regions that are interrelated with uh, through uh, international trade, but all the model is um, is demand driven because it's uh, based on Canadian uh, uh, ideas, and uh, and and then the economic growth is uh, is endogenous because uh, uh, the idea is not to force the system to follow an an, uh, an exogenous economic growth, but to see how the current structure. Um, could determine in the future, depending on alternative scenarios, and so depending on alternative policies packages that we want to test, what are the, uh, uh, the, the economic, what is the economic development in each country and in each area, and what is the impact of economic on the resources and the limit that the resources imposes on economics. So uh, we, so the model is most of the variables are, are endogenous in a sense. But it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a big model. Uh, I don't know if... <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Tiziano. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I, I think um, 
if there are any more questions on our model, and maybe also feel free to contact us afterwards so we can also provide some, some information <laughs> on, on how the model works. Uh, you can also join the project stakeholder board where you get a regular information about uh, our uh, about the project and, and the updates on, on the model. Uh, so Yemi has her hand raised. Yeah, thank you very much for the interventions. And I would like to pose a question to Ludwig Wirt and to Mr. Sieben. I am under the impression that the tax question, especially taxing employment, is kind of under, I don't know, underestimated or kind of under-evaluated. I am under the impression that it's a very important driver for part productivity growth. And I would like to ask you whether I'm under the correct uh, assumption that it doesn't play such a big role in your, in, in your thoughts. And why don't you focus, why don't you focus more on this taxation question? Thanks, Amy. I don't know who would like to go first. Frank, you can. Huh? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll give it. I, I'll try to reply first. I um, let's say from a policy viewpoint, I think it's not underestimated. It figures quite prominently, in particular what we call the European semester, so this coordination process of social economic policies at the European level, where um, the Council issues recommendations to member states, and these recommendations have been rather standard and are included. So member states are encouraged to shift taxes away from labour. Um, to uh, to new forms of environmental energy taxes uh, and so on. Um, the results are mixed. You're right. I don't have the full picture now, but I think uh, this is certainly not what's happening in all countries. And also, particularly difficult to assess in the current context and the crisis context uh, we are living. Um, I would just would probably would like to add the, the, the sentence that what we use in our analysis, I shared the link with the, for the recommendation, you have an accompanying paper, political paper, which summarizes a bit the evidence we think is relevant here, which we have from impact assessments for the Green Deal. Um, I highlighted that many of these impact assessments are positive what concerns overall employment projections until 2030 or 2050. With the caveat, we have to have the right policies in place. If you look into the modeling, which is being done, um, obviously a lot hinges on uh, how are the, uh, how are let's say on the investments first in in the new sectors, but also on how do we recycle revenues? How do we recycle, reuse, redistribute the revenues from new taxes in areas such as emissions trading, carbon pricing, um, energy taxation, and so on. Uh, and a lot of the overall outcomes depend on this. And the modeling does generally assume reductions in labor taxes. One could model different forms of redistributions, which is, which is more tricky. And happy to provide more detail um, on this, how we use the micro simulation model, Euromod, mod, et cetera. But I think there's awareness more, as more granularity is needed on what could be revenue recycling schemes. But the ones we use and we presuppose probably are related to labor taxation. My last point is, but I'm not really an expert there. One of the reasons probably to be um, to be slower, to be to be careful, and there are obviously challenges of raising taxes on energy, on environment, as we see today on the services. But uh, there's the whole question of financing the sustainable um, protect, social protection system. So it was mentioned here by several speakers. And I think the, the, there is the, the overall question on how to ensure this transition or, or, or how to maintain uh, adequacy and uh, sustainability of um, the protection, social protection system overall, which is needed both to address crisis and to, to, to support the transition. And maybe, but again, uh, I'm speculating here, maybe it's not that easy to change gear easily from one system, traditional system to another one. The traditional one is labor-based. Thanks. So, yeah, Ludovic. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. From my side, I would say that on taxation, um, we are we are not against environmental taxation, but we don't think uh, the the 
the division is uh, to shift from labor taxation to environmental taxation. Uh, there's the discussion to have, and I think it was also mentioned by uh, Michel, the, uh, the part of the salaries in the GDP are diminishing. This means that the part of the, uh, of the capital and of the dividends uh, in the GDP is uh, increasing. Uh, so the question is also, uh, I don't, uh, don't know if you put it as a, a taxation on labor, but the, the taxation on capital and on profit uh, is less uh, important uh, than before uh, to finance uh, the yeah the different uh, uh, public needs. Uh, so here we need uh, clearly uh, uh, money to uh, finance uh, social protection systems, to finance public services, to finance investment uh, that would make sure uh, that we can also create quality jobs. Uh, so this uh, this is uh, also uh, there that the shift uh, is happening uh, in uh, between uh, uh, labor uh, revenue revenues and uh, capital revenues. We have no problem per se with environmental taxation, uh, which uh, is, uh, but there uh, we should be uh, quite cautious in, um, in, uh, in who we target uh, in terms of environmental taxation. So if it's environmental taxation on consumers, uh, on, um, it de uh, in depend if, if it's really uh, related to uh, uh, here we have to integrate the question of uh, bad behavior or uh, or not uh, and the, the possibility to change uh, the consumption uh, so we think that environmental taxation can be uh, useful if it's a signal that is sent uh, to the economic actors uh, and uh, to those uh, who uh, who produced uh, uh, it's uh, more efficient if it's uh, targeted to uh, company owners so that they can integrate price uh, signal uh, in uh, how the good uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, in the production than if it's targeted on uh, people uh, in their uh, energy bills in their uh, 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 when they uh, they they put um, a fuel uh, in the car uh, which is basic needs that they have to go to work uh, so there uh, we uh, of course uh, if we need to decarbonate these sectors uh, we need to put uh, to have the money to invest to decarbonate the sectors and we do not think that the, uh, the 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 majority of the shift will be done through uh, send, sending uh, sending press signal uh, to individuals this will have a, a marginal uh, effect uh, on the possibility to change uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the consumption uh, and it risk also uh, and this this brings a large uh, discussion also on the effects of climate policies. It's quite clear that cl climate policies uh, will have uh, will uh, lead uh, to increase in price of goods in the long term, uh, which is also the case of uh, without uh, with what we are um, having now with uh, energy crisis, with speculation, etc. But uh, climate policies will also uh, have that. So, uh, uh, and this is something we can accept. But then you need uh, because that. Uh, if there's inflation, if there's uh, increasing in uh, uh, in cost, you need also that uh, people uh, are able to pay for that. And to be able to pay for that, we need to increase the wages of workers. So uh, here, the, uh, when there's inflation, uh, uh, yeah, in, in fact, if uh, basically, if there's um, um, a limited productivity increase, but a high inflation, in fact, there's uh, uh, there's uh, there's a, uh, a drop in purchasing uh, power, uh, but the choice has to be who will have this drop on pur uh, purchasing power. If there's high inflation and uh, um, and less productivity, uh, for the moment, what we have is that people uh, uh, that are working will lose uh, part of their purchasing power. But this is not the only option we have in our hand. Uh, we could uh, also put this uh, drop in purchasing power on uh, the capital, uh, and this is quite uh, uh, quite important discussion because the public support to climate policies uh, will not last long if it means uh, uh, yeah, uh, increase uh, of, of price of goods when they are not able to pay for them if there's no increase in their wages. So all the social agenda, all the uh, directive on minimum wage, the promotion of collective bargaining, the increase of uh, wages uh, at sectoral level is quite also an answer uh, to the climate uh, transition because the public support will depend on that. Um, thanks, uh, Ludovic and Frank, for, for, for your answers. Um, so we don't I have any... I add one point? Oh, yes. Sorry, oh, yeah, if I have no time, it's running. 
But uh, just to say that in our analysis, we also refer to the whole debate on carbon inequality. So the recent uh, report by the world, in, uh, the world Inequality Report and others, with, that you, let's say, the impacts not only on the, of these taxes differ across the income groups, but also if you look at um, the relative emission levels plus the contribution to emission reductions in the past, there's an unfair distribution. So, which obviously opens also a debate on fair taxation. We do refer to this in general terms in our recommendation. And maybe just to say that there has been a sequencing of papers, how to address, uh, help member states, how to address uh, energy price hikes recently in October and the one of 8 March last week. They present toolboxes what member states can do as terms of emergency measures. I would just would like to the, relate to the latest on 8 March with Power EU because it also mentions um, windfall profits and taxing windfall profits and redistributing this to some part. So I think there's a great openness to, to mobilize, um, to have that discussion, to mobilize all means when needed. Thanks, uh, Frank. Yeah, we were actually quite happy about it when we read it uh, in, in, in the plan. So we, are, we will follow this closely. Um, so we, we only have five minutes left. Maybe just uh, one last question to Michelle and one to Jan. Um, Michelle, um, what do you think, how can meaningful activities employment uh, be combined and what measures needs to be taken? Uh, and for Jan, uh, you mentioned that UBI was not very popular among your members, so I was wondering what are then, um, and then you kind of need this culture shift first, but I was wondering what do you think then are the proposals that you would take forward with your membership now, or what are your next steps in terms of um, yeah, pushing this, this topic? Uh, I'm really sorry I had a technical problem. I did not hear the question. <laughs> so, sorry. I heard the word, the word combined, but... Yeah, sorry. It was uh, how you think we can combine employment and meaningful activities and what you think, um, what measures need to be taken to, to achieve that or do that, in your opinion? Well, uh, I have to admit, it, it's um, it's an area of uh, of the topic that uh, we have considered for a long time that uh, needs further um, work and analysis in the way that, uh, I mean, with the, this experiment uh, of the, those 400 companies that have um, implemented the 4D work week, um, we could indeed see that uh, uh, it's of course not automatic. I think um, uh, it has been said already in the first uh, presentations, of course, huh, that uh, uh, if if you if you have more free time but uh, you use it to take a plane to go to the other side of the world, uh, there's no positive impact uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, of course, uh, and more generally. Um, uh we had many discussions in the in the in the work on the four day work week with people who um are actually i mean we have we've had testimonies of people actually uh, being afraid of 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 um, uh, transitioning to a four day work week because they are afraid they will consume more because uh indeed in in, in today's society it's, it's quite uh, a sad reality that 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 uh, uh, consumption is has become a hobby and, and a way to to um, to, to fill uh, free time. So uh, one extra day of free time uh, a week um, for some people um, could indeed lead to to um, over consumption and, and completely miss miss the the target in terms of uh, of uh, climate impact. Uh, so public policies and it has been mentioned briefly, I think in. The, in the introduction uh, by, by uh, Irmi, uh, the public policies in terms of uh, uh, making um, uh, uh, sports, cultural activities more accessible, uh, especially to those who already today um, have uh, uh, limited access to those uh, uh, those activities and infrastructures, uh, but but also in terms of developing and 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 and. Um, uh, it's, it's been also uh, mentioned in the in the in the panel. Uh, youth people, young people uh, uh, today are already involved in uh, in um, uh, all kinds of of uh, social commitments and and, and community uh, involvements. Uh, but but they, they would be a lot more energy. Uh, human energy and resources available for such activities 
in a, in, in a case of working time reduction. And, and so we would need uh, increasing public support for those kinds of activities. And today that is not the trend that we see, even in Belgium, we can see that, uh, I mean, even like NGOs and, and, and uh, other kind of public interest um, uh, organizations uh, are seeing uh, are seeing uh, their their funding decrease rather than, than increase. So uh, mm -hmm. that would of course need to be um, uh, taking the other direction uh, for 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 this societal change to happen. Thanks, uh, thanks, Michel. Um, I know it's it's half past. I just wanted to yeah maybe give Jan the last uh, word if you. I don't know, would like to react um, to what you think are from your side the next steps um, or regarding to my question. And um, yeah, sorry for only give you one or two minutes, Max. <laughs> thanks, Kat. Yeah, I'll be very brief. And also thanks to the other speakers, really, really interesting. Um, well, to be completely honest, uh, we don't currently have funding to further work on the work topic. So if there are any funders out there in the audience, please contact me. Um, well. I mean, uh, yeah, UBI, when I said UBI is not very popular, like I think most of our member organizations support it, but we don't have like the critical mass to really take it forward. And we're a democratic organization that uh, is basically saying we always need it if we you know, want to go to speak to uh, policymakers about real policy proposals. Uh, what we're currently working on, and this is somewhat related, is um, on addressing the issue of overconsumption and production, right? So. Um, yeah, it might be true, you know, if, uh, if, you know, if we work less in our current culture, we might just consume more. And that's why I was also speaking about the, the need for a cultural shift there. So, um, yeah, currently working on uh, establishing material footprint reduction targets. So the discussion sur surfaced in the circuit economy action plan, which I think is just really, really important uh, because ultimately, you know, uh, the climate crisis is just a symptom of the real crisis, which is overshoot that we are producing and consuming way too much. I think that was also sort of what we've heard from, from many of the, the speakers. Um, and then, then, yeah, working time reduction is a really, really uh, popular one and also shifting uh, resources from uh, labor to uh, uh, the environment. Uh, so another one we've heard today is also quite popular among our membership, because I think there's a really strong argument to make that, you know, well, ultimately, these are all negative uh, environmental externalities. And, you know, even if there is, you know, even if, if it's expensive now, or even if it's cheap, like right now, it's getting more expensive, but you can still take a Ryanair flight somewhere for five euros. But the, the problem still remains that someone has to pay the costs for this. And it's mainly innocent bystanders, people in the global south. And of course, future generations will suffer the impacts of, of climate uh, change. So, uh, going to stop here, but really interesting discussion. So thanks, everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Jan. Um, yeah, I, I will close it now here. But uh, thanks a lot to all of our speakers and to all of our interventions and also... Sorry, Kathy. May I again make a short announcement? Also, because yes. A question. Just to say that we are uh, in like, as is included in the easy work program, the employment and social innovation uh, program. Uh, we will publish this year uh, social innovation call on social innovation for Fair Green and Digital Transitions, they should come out in May. So if you want further information, please have a look. It's open to associations, social economy actors, and many others. So there, there may be opportunities um, for you or your members. Please um, share this widely if that's of interest to you and write to me if you want more information. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Frank, for this. <laughs> so yeah, there's an opportunity to work more on this. Uh, so yeah, we should all visit the website. And, and as Frank said, um, please contact him if, if he has any questions. So maybe that's also <laughs> a nice word to, to end uh, with some um, positive um, as, um, aspects. Uh, I also, I mean, we don't really have time to conclude a lot, but I think yeah, it's, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, it's very linked to the overall systemic changes that we need. And I think we, yeah, we need to have some further discussions on how we can actually implement this or materialize this or flesh out a bit of the, the proposals that we heard today. So have a really nice uh, afternoon and, and thanks a lot again. Bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.